This program is part of American Graduate. Let's make it happen. A public media initiative made possible by the Corporation for Public Broadcasting. Internet. Good, it's Public education is no longer bound by zip codes in Nashville. Many parents hand pick schools for their children. We want to make sure we make a match between what our, what our kids' strengths and weaknesses are with the different schools. Obviously, with five kids, we got to figure out how to get everyone everywhere. Remember, right is the right choice. School choice is part of the effort to improve student outcomes, encouraged by school officials. That's why it's a lottery system. It's no, and that's what I really like about it. Every student has the same opportunity as others. It is a challenge, but I think that it's the district's responsibility to offer quality choices to all families, and this process is the mechanism to do that. Welcome to Inglewood. Thank you. It is confusing as all get out because you're prioritized and then you're computerized and then your, your choices are parsed. That's not choice. That's, that's, that's mechanics. Supporters of choice say it is the equalizer in public education. It puts a lot of pressure on all the schools to get better and to recruit. That's a different world for us. Ideally, you know, in, in the imaginary pink unicorn world, yes, but is it really a choice for your family if you're going to have to drive you know, 20 miles across county. I mean, that single mom, that may not be a choice for her at all. What ends up happening is that in the poorer community, the, the less poor of the poor community are the ones who have the ability to bring their kids to the school that's further away or to navigate the process. Along the way, communities are dividing as school options increase, while researchers scramble to figure out how public school choice works best. Everyone likes the cheer song. Sometimes you want to go where everybody knows your name. They're always glad you came. And if that's not the case, am I making the best choice? Right now, it's sort of a wild west. It's sort of every child for themselves in, in a school choice system. Any school that's educating is a good school. Whether it's the right school for you is a whole different thing. And I think school choice really allows you to find which environment you best learn in and um, helps you to really grow. In a few months, Savannah Richardson will graduate from Hunters Lane High School in Nashville. She's an honor student in the International Baccalaureate Program. Richardson's high school and every school she has attended since first grade has been assigned based on her zip code, the school she is zoned to by Metro Nashville Public Schools. It's definitely diverse. I have friends from different backgrounds. There's people from different countries, so many different people, and you get those so many different points of view. I would not be happy anywhere but where I am. At one time, it seemed that Savannah's two younger brothers would follow in her footsteps through their zoned public schools. But this year, the Richardsons made other choices for the boys. This school year, I did not cry on the first day of school because I think I was finally at peace with where my kids were at. And I have my senior finishing up her senior year at the locally zoned public high school. I have my sophomore at a private school. And I have my eighth grader at a charter school. And they're all perfect fits for each kid. Ready? There he is, that's him. To make it work is a juggle for the whole family. It's a huge undertaking to get three different schools, three different kids, calendar organized, and to make sure you're where you're ne you need to be. Ultimately, I had to, I have to do what's best for my children. And this is a choice available to me right now. And I'm gonna take it, and it is working. Teresa Richardson admits to being a reluctant participant or even supporter of school choice for several reasons. I wondered if that was gonna ne negatively impact 
um, the strides or the progress Nashville had made with desegregation. Richardson wondered if choice would create chaos. Uh, how's this gonna work? Who, who's in charge of this? Do they know what they're doing? Have they thought this through? And would she have the information, time and savvy to choose wisely? Yes, it is a lot of work and that's what I'm saying. It felt daunting, it felt overwhelming. Most unsettling was the guilt. There were lots of great things and great teachers about our local um, our locally zoned public schools, so many great things, and I wanted to support that, and I felt like, you know, am I a sellout? Richardson's mixed feelings reflect broader uncertainties about the intent and the impact of school choice systems. What is the goal? How does it affect student outcomes, the graduation rate? School choice is actually based on an economic model, first presented by Milton Friedman in the mid-20th century. It continues to intrigue economists and educators, like Dr. Sean Corcoran at New York University. I think there's the hope that school choice will be a sort of a tide that lifts all boats, um, that if you have sort of a market type system where kids uh, choose good schools, um, the bad schools will tend to go out of business over time. So if they lose enrollment, um, if they're not up to what parents want, um, you know, hopefully over time those schools will disappear. Um, whether or not it actually works that way in practice, I think, is another question, um, but that's the idea. Corcoran has studied school choice for the last decade, primarily in New York City, which has one of the most expansive and long-standing high school choice systems in the country. Graduation rates have really improved in New York City, uh, but it's, it's hard to point to the school choice system as the catalyst for that. There's certainly research that shows that kids who gain access to their top choice school, um, tend to do better than, school, than kids who don't get admitted to their top choice school. That could be a function of the choice process, that they were able to identify a school that um, works for them. It could be that they got access to a school that was one of the better schools and only so many kids can go. Um, and so if you're lucky enough to get into that school, you perform better. But for every kid who gets into one of those schools, there's a kid who doesn't get into one of those schools. That's why some parents see choice more as chance in public school systems. And there is that concept that if your child doesn't get in to one of the academic magnets, that it's, it's really not a good thing. And if you do, you hooray, we really have won the lottery. I mean, give me that over Powerball. Um, what you have for lunch? Maria Salas is the single parent of Owen, a fourth grader at a public elementary school in Nashville. The year between fourth and fifth grade is pivotal for many families, and the first time they're confronted with the need to choose a school other than the one that matches their zip code. I got one kid, one shot to get it right. We'll look at our zone public school. We'll, there's a few private schools that we'll look at, and then at least one charter school option, and then um, apply for the Metro Academic Lotteries. Salas, an attorney, is analytical, persistent, and strategic about choosing a middle school for Owen. I've sold the house, so if we decided, for example, that we need to move out of county, which I would, would be a real stretch for me, I, I love Nashville, or it gives me a little bit of a cushion if I needed to take the proceeds from the sale of the house and decide that um, we're gonna pay for private school. It bothers me that I don't have the no-brainer at fifth grade like I felt like I did in kindergarten and, and first grade based on you know where I currently live. Zip codes and addresses still play a role in public school assignment but increasingly students are choosing to attend a school other than their default assigned school. According to the Brown Center on Educational Policy at Brookings, 51% of the nation's 100 largest school districts, including Nashville-Davidson County, offer choice at the high school level. The National Center for Education Statistics reports that in districts with public school choice, about 25% of students attend a chosen public school, 67% attend their assigned school, the rest attend private school. But a different statistic hints at why some school districts are expanding choice. 27% of parents with students in public schools say they relocated so their child could attend a particular school. So I think when districts initially sought out choices through magnet programs, they were actually hoping that their, 
would create greater integration across uh, stu uh, families of different races or different socioeconomic status. Over time, I think it's become more than that. More recently, there's been this large outflow of, of students into the suburbs from uh, inner city school districts. And one of the things school choice can do is potentially stem that flow. Dr. Ron Zimmer is an associate professor at Vanderbilt's Peabody College of Education. He has studied how families choose schools when choice is offered. So it may be a little bit of a function of the family. Some families might just see this as too overwhelming, throw their hands up in the air and say, I'll just go to the default school. Mm -hmm. And some other families might really invest the energy into making this choice and sift through all this material. And so you might actually create greater segregation by those who have the means to sift through this information and those who do not. We have a morning of like meetings every morning. This is the First Choice Festival, a massive effort by Metro Nashville Public Schools each fall to inform, promote what it offers, and keep students in the district. The First Choice Festival is marked by catchy displays, giveaways, and entertainment. But a close look reveals a serious side. We're here to look at middle schools and eventually high schools. So we were just kind of looking where different schools are located and looking where we're going right now. It's good that we have a lot of options, but it's also challenging to make the decision. <laughs> All right, I'll say thank you. Thank you. It almost makes me feel like, almost, say they can just stay at the schools that they attend now so that we don't have to go through the paperwork and all the process and this and that. But like I said, I don't really know the process, so I need to find out the process first. You get a lot of information. They give you walkthroughs. You pick your top seven choices. You send it in, cross your fingers, and hope for the best. What the district did last year is we implemented high school choice. Seven is an important number in the MMPS school choice process the number that gives families the best chance at getting the schools they want. We did a study to determine how many choices should we offer to guarantee that a family will get placed somewhere. And when we looked at the number five, there were still families you could pick up to five and still not get in somewhere. We had to go to as many as seven to assure that you're guaranteed a slot somewhere. Chris Weber oversees student assignment services. Specifically, I'm responsible for developing the architecture to support the school choice process. So that's to develop a process that's fair, that's equitable, that's easy for parents to understand. The model that we're following is similar to what several school districts have been using. Many models for school choice have some degree of chance in how students are assigned, and that frustrates parents who are skeptical about current school reform efforts. If I have Charter A that does things this way and Charter B that does things this way, and I have the zone school, and then I have this magnet school, and I can choose to send my child to one of them, well, in Nashville, you can ask to send your child to one of them, but you're not guaranteed to get any of them. Good to see you again. Hi. Hi. Again. Jay Sanders has two young daughters, one in second grade at their neighborhood zone school in East Nashville, Inglewood Elementary, a school on the priority list of low-performing schools in Tennessee. We had friends who were confused by our choice of Inglewood. They were like, why, why would you send a gifted child to a school that has such low scores? And our perspective was, it's our neighborhood school. We are a part of the neighborhood. This is our community. Um, if we don't support our community, who will? Sanders grew up in Inglewood, in the same house where he's now rearing his daughters. Just within the next block, there are a lot of young families. I mean, you never know what that means, but the anticipation would be that, you know, within five years or so, we'll, we'll see a lot more pre-K uh, students. Sanders quickly learned that his neighborhood is changing, and so is the neighborhood school. This was my first experience back in school. The last time I'd been in a classroom was when I was a student, and let alone an elementary classroom. His daughter had been in school less than a month when MNPS announced a plan for the low-performing school, 
remove the principal, most faculty, and bring in a charter operator to turn things around and raise test scores. We just said, look, I don't know what you guys are gonna do, but we don't want this to happen. We want you to support the principal and the faculty we already have because we think that they can do the job if they're supported properly. Our first order of business... Sanders and others made their case at the next school board meeting, unaware that former Metro Schools director, Dr. Jesse Register, would make a stunning announcement. Therefore, I propose that we convert the East Nashville Carter to an all-choice zone. We must consider converting one or two priority schools to successful charters. And finally, we must consider the option of closing and consolidating low-performing schools in the zone. He drops this huge bomb that confused and, I mean, really confused and frustrated a lot of parents. Register's announcement of an all-choice school zone heated up a simmering debate that often divides communities between those who want only traditional zone schools and those who want a wide array of school options, including magnets and charters. Frankly, I really got tired of that debate. What we ought to be talking about is how do you create good schools and how do you work collaboratively to do that. Register stepped down as director of schools. He now teaches at Belmont University and runs a new Center for Educational Systems Improvement, a think tank to help school administrators deal with reform. One of the reasons why I'm an advocate of choice is that if it's done correctly, and you have to really underline that, you really have to underscore that, if it's done correctly, then choice can lead to more diverse schools and diversity is a very important factor in improving student achievement. I think you'll find research will show that all children do well in diverse settings. It's not good choice if only those parents who can drive their kids out of their neighborhood are the ones who select it. It needs to be for everybody, and I think that's a work in progress in the district also. And that's the rub, according to some parent leaders who say MMPS has gone too far, expanding a choice system that is detrimental to traditional zoned schools. At the rate we're going, if we stay on the same path, uh, our neighborhood schools are going to be turned into destinations of last resort for our street children. And we need to make sure with our zest for choice that you know, we're not inadvertently uh, turning our system into something like that. Chris Moth leads the Parent Advisory Committee for Hillsboro, an affluent community that sees a noticeable and, according to Moth, detrimental impact from school choice. MNPS data related to the Hillsboro zone shows less than half the zone's fourth graders move on to the assigned middle school. A large number leave for charter and other public schools and private schools, and a significant number of students choose so-called auto pathway schools that offer guaranteed slots later in highly sought lottery-based magnet schools. I mean, we have this, this system that somewhat drives parents away. Enter this lottery in fourth grade, oh sorry you lose. You know, it's a lot to deal with psychologically. And I think uh, we won't have as strong a school system as we could if parents are convinced by the system that they're losers and that they need to move away. There is growing pushback against this type of market-driven approach to education reform. It's all based on this premise that schools aren't trying very hard and if we make them compete, kind of like what is it, the, the, the Hunger Games, uh, they'll all get better. But wherever they've tried this, it, it hasn't worked. So I feel like it's making, things, it's making things worse. Gary Rubenstein is a math teacher in New York, author of several books for new teachers, and a blogger who has gained a national following for his editorials on public education. Early in his career as a Teach for America recruit, Rubenstein embraced school reform efforts. Not anymore. It's not that, that I'm against reform, but reform nowadays means shut down schools, fire teachers based on standardized test scores, and as happens a lot, let that school be taken over by a, a charter school and, and the idea of this sort of uh, privatization. So I just started by looking at just publicly available data and analyzing them, running 
statistical analysis. Since I'm a math teacher, I know the statistics. Rubenstein pays close attention to Tennessee, in part because of how the state measures school quality, using student growth scores related to academic progress. It's called TVOS, Tennessee Value Added Assessment System, and many parents use these scores to evaluate school choices. In Tennessee, I could look at the same school two consecutive years, and one year they get the highest possible growth score, the next year they get the lowest possible growth score. How accurate can this growth measure be if a school that admits they did about the same thing two years in a row got these wildly uh, different scores? A concern I have is that the, uh, these growth scores are so inaccurate that they, that they become these, uh, a self-fulfilling prophecy. The state says this school has low growth, people leave the school, and now it becomes, you know, the school gets worse and they say, see, you know, we, we told you so. Education researchers have not found evidence that neighborhood schools decline simply because students exit for other choices. Across all these studies, both for vouchers and charter schools, there's really not been much evidence of that. So these schools, the introduction of charter schools or vouchers at, um, aren't at worst making the traditional public schools any worse off in terms of their performance, and there's some evidence it might make it slightly better. Another finding in Zimmer's research challenges what's known as skimming, the idea that the best students leave neighborhood schools for magnets, charters, and other public school options. We found that the students leaving for a charter school look very similar to the students that were in the traditional public school in terms of achievement. So we didn't find much evidence of cream skimming. So what is the ultimate effect on achievement, graduation, and beyond when a student chooses a non-traditional public school? Much of the literature has suggested that they're not producing any better effects on student achievement. But in a couple of these locations, Chicago and Florida, we were actually able to look at long-term outcomes. And so we didn't find any test score effects, but we found higher high school graduation effects higher college attendance effects, and eventually we've been seeing higher income effects. And so what this is suggesting is that test scores may not fully capture the quality of a school. He was so excited, he almost fell in. There's a sense of paternalism. It's we need to fix their stuff um, so that they can do better. And I mean, in a lot of ways it's true. We need to fix their stuff so they can do better. But when it comes from outside entities, uh, it's, it's just not the same thing as, you know, somebody in Casey Holmes saying, we need to fix our stuff. Um, and um, because the implication is there are ulterior motives. The racial economic aspect of the debate is far more theoretical for a lot of people. That raises the unspoken and often overlooked reason that school choice becomes contentious. The term is coded with notions and discomfort rooted in our history of desegregation, according to education historians. There was a lot of trauma associated with desegregation and integration. There were a lot of people who did not flourish in these environments. There are a lot of people who have still very painful um, memories associated with very tough experiences. I think that's in large part the problem. You want to get me out of my community into some other community that has better options. I want you to bring better options to my community. And I think that is really what people are railing against, this whole notion that in order to give my child a quality education, I shouldn't have to bust them across the city for an hour or two each day. School choice has rarely been convenient, not in the 70s, not today. And questions remain about whether choice is the great equalizer for the achievement gap. Single parent homes, um, um, immigrant communities where parents uh, are less likely to speak English as their first language. You know, they may be, because of time, because of resources, because of an inability to understand the high school choice process, they're more likely to push that down to the uh, child, you know, and let them decide what school's best for them. What seems evident to researchers, observers, and parents is that choice is now entrenched in major public school districts, even without consensus about how to implement it.
If you took away those options, you could in theory force families to go to these other schools, but in nature, who's to say that that's really where they would go? Would they choose to go to private schools? Would they choose to leave the county? And who's to say that that really uh, it would make that school better? I could see having a couple of choices. I could see the idea of that, but the implementation, the way that everyone's been doing it has been uh, very complicated and uh, anxiety provoking. The pendulum will shift back. I think there is a division developing and the students are aware of it. What's best for the kids is getting lost in that political discussion and the money and the testing discussions and, and even discipline discussions. Um, but what it comes down to is what's best for your kid is not what's best for my kid. And I think it's awesome that the families have the choice to figure out what is best for their family and what is best for their kids. This program is part of American Graduate, Let's Make It Happen, a public media initiative made possible by the Corporation for Public Broadcasting.